How many of you all have heard of the phenomena that is Marie Kondo? Anybody raise your hands? All right, some are really high, some are ashamedly up. You know, it's kind of like, yeah, I kind of know. For those of you who don't have your hand up and you have a real life, let me explain who Marie Kondo is. Uh, Marie Kondo is an organizational consultant. She wrote a best-selling book called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, and she has a Netflix special with the very same title, Tidying Up. And if you don't know Marie Kondo, the thing she is most known for is her principle of sparking joy. So in her show, what she does is she goes to these homes of people who are, you know, got stuff everywhere, and they haul everything out of their rooms and they into this big pile, and they're supposed to s- sit by this pile and every th- object they have to handle and touch, and they only keep the things that, quote, spark joy. Uh, spark joy is an English translation of a Japanese word, which really means to make your heart throb or for your heart to flutter. So the only things that you're able to keep is that which sparks joy or makes your heart throb. Some of you are thinking about everything in your house wondering, I think I would be in an empty room. I bet. But let me ask you this, though. Here's the question. If I were to go into your house this afternoon and haul out everything that you own and make a big old pile in your living room, and force you to sit beside that and go through every object, would you get to keep your Bible? Now, I'm not asking, do you want to keep your Bible? And I'm not asking, do you think you should keep your Bible? I'm saying, if the criteria is you only get to keep the things that make your heart throb and that spark joy, would you be able, would you be allowed to keep your Bible? We've been marching through the book of Kings this summer. If you're a guest with us today, we've been looking at these kings between the death of Solomon and the fall of Jerusalem. And most of the kings that we've come across are kings that did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. We're reading them because we believe 1 Corinthians 10. These things were written for our instruction as an example that we should not do what they have been doing. Every once in a while we come across a righteous king that does something that we should do what they did. And today's one of those days. We are reading about who this guy who is probably the most righteous king in this entire historical period. Of all of these kings, this is the high point. We're reading this morning the story of the man named Josiah. Josiah becomes king when he is eight years old. He has an interesting pedigree. His father is an evil, wicked king. His grandfather is Manasseh this evil, wicked king that repented at the end of his life. His great-grandfather is Hezekiah, this incredibly righteous king. So he has this very disturbing family history. Very righteous, very evil, very, you know. uh, But he's eight years old when he becomes king. He becomes king because his father is assassinated, and he becomes king at eight years old. We find out that when he turns 16, he begins to seek the God of of David. 16-year-old, he began to seek the God of David. And when he's 20 is when he first begins to use his power as king to try to purge Israel of all the pagan worship. So if you've been following the timeline here, his grandfather Manasseh, very evil king, filled the land with pagan worship. But at the end of his life, Manasseh came to repentance, came back to Jerusalem and tried to clean Jerusalem of all the pagan worship. Well, his son Amon, after Manasseh dies, puts all the stuff back in. And so Josiah has to come and and undo everything that his father Amon has done. When he's 20, he begins to use the power of the throne to purge the land. But when he's 26, when he's 26, he has a life-changing experience. When he's 26, he's been leading the nation on a, a rebuilding, remodeling project of the temple. Remember, the temple at this time is 300 years old. It's a very old building. So he's going to remodel the temple, rebuild the temple, and the high priest discovers a book in the remodel. It's the book of the law. So this is the event I want us to look at. It's in 2 Kings chapter 22. It begins in verse 8. If you want to read the same translation I'm reading, it's in your bulletin notes. So Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And Shaphan the secretary came to the king, reported to the king, your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house. They've delivered it to the hand of the workmen who 
have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Now, there's a lot going on in the opening paragraph, isn't there? Can you imagine the book of the law being lost to the point that when it's found, it's big news? I mean, can you imagine this church was built in 1954 when it started? And if we had lost the Bible and, and somewhere along the way when we were doing spring cleaning, someone came up and said, hey, we found the Bible. I'm like, wow, we hadn't seen that in forever. I mean, we forgot that was even there. I mean, that's how bad things had gotten. We're not exactly sure. The, the book of the law, uh, can, the law can refer to the entire covenant that God made with Moses. It can refer to the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Most scholars think that what was found here was the scroll of Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy literally means a copy of the law. So after the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, when they got to the edge of the promised land, Moses uh, wrote down a copy of the law. He, he retold the Exodus story. He retold the law that, gave, uh, that God had given to him, and he wrote it down. And there's a couple of things about this scroll that I want you to realize, and you understand why uh, Josiah tears his clothes. At the end of Deuteronomy, Moses uh, has this uh, ceremony when he reads the blessings and the curses of the law. So he says, if you go into the land of promise and you are faithful to the covenant, this is all the ways that God's going to bless you. And you can read it. It's just chapter. It just goes on and on and on, all the blessings. And then in chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, Moses says, but if you go into the land of promise, and you forsake the covenant, these are all the curses. And it's a long chapter. It's everything from, from blight to mildew to famine to drought to your children be sold into slavery. You'll, fall, uh, you'll become captive by other nations. It's just this long list of all of the curses that are going to come upon you. So imagine when Shaphan is reading the scroll of Deuteronomy to Josiah, and he's read all of these laws, and Josiah knows we haven't been keeping all these laws. And he gets to all the curses, what's going to happen to you. Now you understand why Josiah reacts by ripping his clothes in grief. He's like, oh my goodness, we've not been doing any of this. And look at the wrath of God that's promised upon us. Now the second thing I want you to know about the book of Deuteronomy is there's one section in Deuteronomy that talks specifically to the king. There's one paragraph in Deuteronomy 17 that says specifically to a king, when you have a king, this is what a king should do. And I put the the uh, key verses there in your notes, it says in chapter 17, when this king sits on the throne, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priest, and it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them. And he goes on to say that he would not deviate to the right or to the left of that. So Josiah is hearing this read to him, and he gets to the point about what a king's supposed to do and is realizing, I've not made a handwritten copy of the law. I don't have a copy of the law beside my throne. I haven't been reading it all the days of my life. I don't even know what's in it. I've never even heard it before. And now we hear all of the curses that are going to happen to us because we've been disobeying it. And he, to use the Hebrew phrase, he freaks out. Because he realizes all of the wrath that's coming. And so look what he does in verse, 11, uh, verse 12. He says, the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and these other guys who are in part of his inner circle. And he says in verse 13, go inquire of the Lord for me and pray for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. Interesting phrase, verse 13, go inquire of the Lord. Now, what's the question? He's already heard the law, so he knows what he's supposed to be doing and has not been doing. He already has heard about the wrath that's promised if you don't do it. He's already heard all that, so what's the question? I think the question that Josiah wants to know is, is the wrath coming for sure, or is there going to be a chance for us to repent and be spared? I mean, is the, is the wrath of done deal? Or maybe God would forgive us. Go inquire of the Lord for me. 
And so Hilkiah the priest and this inner circle of advisors, they go and they find, you notice in verse 14, they find Huldah the prophetess. It's interesting, they go to Huldah. I'd like to know more about Huldah. Uh, they don't go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah begins to minister in the days of Josiah, but they don't go find Jeremiah. Uh, Zephaniah, Nahum, and Habakkuk, all three of those guys are ministering during Josiah's days, but they don't go to find them. They go to find Huldah, the prophetess. There are three ladies in the Old Testament who get this title, prophetess. There's Miriam, there's Deborah, and then there's Huldah. And Huldah uh, knows the word of the Lord and speaks the word of the Lord to this inner circle, interprets it, applies it, and says, Thus saith the Lord to this inner group. And notice what she says to them in verse 15. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants, all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me, have made offerings to other gods, that they might provoke me, provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore my wrath will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. That was Josiah's question. Is the wrath coming? Or is there an opportunity that maybe we could repent and be spared? And the prophet just says, it's coming. Game on. The wrath shall not be quenched. Here it comes. But, in verse 18, but to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was penitent and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhab inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse. And you have torn your clothes and you have wept before me. I have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers. You shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place. And they brought back word to the king. She says to Josiah, because your heart was, and the word the ESV translates is penitent. Your translation may say responsive, or your translation may say tender. Probably responsive is a better translation of that word. Because your heart was responsive to the word of God. Because, to use Marie Kondo language, because the word of God made your heart throb. Because it made your heart flutter. Because it sparked joy. Because you responded to the word of God. Because of that, your eyes will not see the wrath of God. It will happen after, your, after you die. So here, here's the question. So... If, if Huldah had said that to you, what's your next step? I mean, wouldn't you just kind of like go, whew, I'm safe. Let's go back to the palace and watch ESPN because I don't have to worry anymore because I can just kind of cruise out the rest of my life and my life's going to be happy. It's not what Josiah does because Josiah's heart responds to the Word of God. Josiah's heart it throbs at the Word of God. And so what happens in chapter 23 is Josiah does the very same thing that Moses did at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. So remember he has, has the scroll read to him and he realizes, I've not been making a copy of this thing. I don't know what's in this law. We haven't been doing. These are the curses. And what Moses does at the end of the book of Deuteronomy is he has a covenant renewal ceremony where he reads all of that to all the people and he says to the people, do you agree to abide by this covenant? This is what Josiah does. The king sent in chapter 23, verse 1, all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him, and the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great, and he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar, and he made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes, with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. So we see in Josiah, we see a heart that is responsive to the word of God. Which is why Josiah is one of the few kings, very few kings throughout this period, who are identified as walking in the ways of David. I mean, we're familiar with they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, they did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But very few kings are identified as walking in the ways of David. And one of the things about David that we know so well is that David loved, 
the Word of God. He loved the law of the Lord. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in all of your Bible, and it's, I don't know, like 16,000 verses long, right? And it's all about David loving the law and why he loves the law. Uh, fortunately, there's a shorter version in Psalm 19 that I put there in your notes, kind of a shorter version of Psalm 119. But look what David says about Scripture. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them, there is great reward. You see David's responsive heart to the word of God. And he uses all those words to describe it, the law, the testimony, the precepts, the commandments, the rules of God. But look what he says, the benefits. He says, not only are they true and sure and they're right. He says, but, but they do things, those who devote themselves to the word of God. He talks about how he makes the simple wise. It's through the word of God and through the scripture that Simple people like me are made uh, wise and get the wisdom of God. Also notice that it's, it rejoices the heart. It causes the heart to, to spark joy uh, because of the word of God. Notice it talks about reviving the soul. It breathes life into our soul. It enlightens the eyes so we see and we see clearly. And it's through the word of God that we are warned about the dangers of disobedience, and it's through the Word of God that we have promises of the blessings of obedience, and all of that comes through the Word of God. And Josiah has this heart. Josiah is responsive to the Word of God, and because of that, uh, God blesses him and says, your eyes will not see this disaster. So what do we do with all this as the people of God who live uh, a long time after Josiah? Let me just focus us on these three statements that are in your bulletin you want to fill in the blanks. The the first one is this, neglecting the word of God brings self-destruction. Neglecting the word of God brings self-destruction. So all through the scriptures, we see what happens to individuals when they neglect the word of God. Have you read the book of Judges? Anybody read the book of Judges? You ever read the book of Judges and read those stories and like, why am I reading this in the Bible? These stories are horrible. Because if you notice in the book of Judges, the law does not appear at all during this 400-year period. And everyone does what is right in their own eyes. And when there is no word of God and everyone does what is right in their own eyes, what you end up with is stories like that are found in the book of Judges. All through the, the history we've been reading, everybody's been doing what is right in their own eyes, and we end up with these stories. And we see it in our culture today. Culture today that is totally neglecting the word of God, And everything that's promised in the Word of God that David knew is absent from our culture. But let's be honest, we see it in ourselves. That when we neglect the Word of God, what the the things that David says come into our life, the joy in our heart, reviving of our soul, opening our eyes, the wisdom, uh, being warned about the dangers of disobedience, being encouraged by the promise promise of obedience, those things begin to fade away. And the consequence is self-destruction, we bring pain into our own life. You see, many Christians, I think, have this approach to the Word of God. It's kind of like, I know I ought to be reading the Bible, right? I doubt any of y'all, that's news to anybody, right? You came to church today and like, oh, I didn't know, I was supposed to be reading the Bible. No, we all know we ought to be reading the Bible. But what we think is, if we neglect to read the Bible... The one who suffers the consequence really is God, not us. In other words, if, if, if I neglect to read the Bible, it's going to hurt God's feelings. If I neglect to read the Bible, this is God's word to me, and so I'm kind of being rude to him. If I, if I neglect to read the Bible, the one who's going to pay the consequences are God. When the reality is, if we neglect the word of God, the one who pays the consequences is ourself. So many of us, just not convinced that neglecting the Word of God brings self-destruction. In other words, we think that we can handle the Bible in such a way that it really doesn't make our heart throb, and our life's really not going to be the worst because of it. That's how many Christians really honestly view the Word of God. 
Josiah reminds us, neglecting the word of God brings self-destruction. The second thing is that the word of God requires a response. The word of God requires a response. It's not enough just to, to read or be exposed or have opinions about it. There is a response that is required. Josiah is blessed by God because his heart was responsive. His heart was tender, and he was spared uh, the wrath of God, which is why the Bible says don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word of God. So Josiah's response in chapter 23 there, notice he talked about how he made a covenant before the Lord. It's kind of relational terms. Uh, So the response that God wants us to have when it comes to the word of God is realizing that this is a vehicle of your relationship with God. This is the way that you relate to God. God speaks to you through his word. You hear his voice. You understand his heart. All of that comes through the scriptures and the word of God. And then you see Josiah making that commitment to say, I will obey the commandments with all of my heart and with all of my soul, and I will put them into practice. Which leads us to this final statement that valuing the Bible is not enough. Valuing the Bible is not enough. Simply holding the Bible in high regard is not the kind of response that God wants from us. So this simple commandment for the king, the king was to make a handwritten copy of the book of Deuteronomy, have it beside his throne. He was supposed to be reading it all of the days of his life so he could be careful to do everything that was written in it. Aren't you glad that you don't have to make a handwritten copy of the word of God? That you live in a printing press day and and digital access to Bible? I mean, if I had to make a handwritten copy of the word of God, I wouldn't be able to read it after chapter 2. Uh, Because I can't read my own handwriting. But you don't have to do that. And yet, we are the generation that is in danger of holding the Bible in high esteem and neglecting the Bible at the same time. We have a generation, and you ask them, what do you think about the Bible? Oh, the Bible is the Word of God. Oh, the Bible is very valuable. And they hold it in high esteem, but functionally are neglecting the Bible at the same time. See, valuing the Bible is not enough. And we see just from this what the king was supposed to do, uh, first of all, and we see that in our own life. For instance, the king was supposed to read it in all the days of his life. So the opposite of neglecting the Bible, the first thing is reading the Bible regularly. I've I've referenced this study many times. Uh, The Center for Bible Engagement has done research on this. How many days a week Do you need to read the Bible? I see the right number shown at me. How many days a week do you need to read read the Bible in order for the Bible to have a transformative effect on your life? And the magic number is four. If you read the Bible three days or less, statistically speaking, for those of us who can say the word, uh, their research shows that your life is no different in your behaviors from those who never read the Bible at all. So if you want your life to be transformed by Scripture, you have to read at least four or more days a week, which is why we have in our bulletin a a five-day-a-week Bible reading plan. It's in the bottom right page. This year, if you follow that, you'll be reading the entire New Testament through the course of the year. We're trying to get you over that four-day hump, at least five days a week. So here's my question for you this morning. What is your Bible reading plan? What is your plan to read the Bible? Because if you do not have a plan, I would be willing to bet you are probably not reading the Bible four more days a week. I mean, we don't do anything regular if we don't have a plan. What's your Bible reading plan? Because the first thing of not neglecting Scripture is reading it. Second thing about not neglecting Scripture, not only is reading it, but we need to meditate on it. Now, to meditate just simply means to slow down long enough to think about what you've read so that you can grab onto what God is trying to say to you. How many of you have ever, ever had this experience? You have your quiet time in the morning, and then you, you, you get up, and you, you get in your car, and you go to work, and before you've hit I-20, you have completely forgotten everything that you've read. Like, you don't even know what chapter of the Bible you read. You don't even know if you were in the Old Testament or the New Testament. You think you were in the New. You don't. Anybody? Okay, y'all are all lying like crazy because it happens to everybody, Okay. Because if you don't have a system, a method that you grab onto the Word of God and think about it so that it doesn't flee, it is going to fly right away. 
which is why in our discipleship groups we teach a very simple method of journaling, which is a way of just slowing yourself down to say, what is God saying to me through the Scripture so that I can catch it before it flies away? So the opposite of neglecting the Word of God is, is reading it regularly, is meditating on it in some way. And the third thing is to memorize it. Memorize Scripture. David knew, thy word I have hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. It's not enough just to have it there in the book beside the throne. But you've got to have it in your heart so that it begins to change your thinking and your feeling from the inside out. So let me ask you this question. Have you memorized a verse from Scripture in the last 30 days that you can quote word for word and give me the reference? I kind of wanted to hear a yes, but maybe that's all right. Or no. Seriously. Memorizing Scripture is a key part of handling the Word of God. So if you're not reading it at least four days a week, if you don't have a strategy to make sure that it doesn't just fly right through your eyeballs and you, and you can grab on to that which God is saying to you, and if you're not working to memorize it, I think you are in danger of becoming the generation that has a high value of this book, but functionally you neglect it because it's really not transforming your life. So to be responsive to the Word of God, we need to read it. We need to handle it properly. Another thing is to be responsive to the Word of God, we need to obey it. Um, to read the Word, to journal on the Word, to memorize on the Word, but that, to get to the place where you just decide, I don't need to obey the Word, is the same thing as neglecting the Word. I could choose several areas, but let me just choose two this morning, just two examples that I think particularly in America, the church has just absolutely looked at the teachings of Scripture and said, I don't need that, I don't need that, I don't need that. For instance, is in our sexual ethic. I mean, the Bible is pretty clear. Sex is God's gift for in the confines of a biblical marriage covenant between a man and a woman. All other expressions outside of that are immoral and against God's laws. And yet, I, I saw this this week. Uh, just a recent survey, 50% of those who attend church regularly admit to being sexually active outside the confines of marriage. 50%. Basically, it's going through Scripture and saying, well, I, I don't need that. Well, I, that, I don't need to worry about that. I don't, I don't need to obey that. I can ignore that. That didn't apply to me. Uh, that was, you know, so last year, uh, I don't need that. I don't. Just neglecting the Word of God. And it's thinking that I can neglect the Word of God and it's not going to bring self-destruction into my life. Uh, I say the same thing about pornography. Statistics say that uh, pornography usage of, of people who attend church and those who do not attend church is functionally the same. Jesus is very clear. Looking at a woman with lust at that, Looking on a woman with lust in your heart is the same thing as committing adultery, sexual immorality. And people within the body of Christ, within the church, ought not to be engaging with pornography. And yet we, we look at that and say, well, you know, you know, well, and we're just neglecting the Word of God. Another area that I think it shows up just very clearly is the way in which we treat our attitude and our actions that we treat those who disagree with us and don't like us. I don't know if you've been paying attention. The world around you basically says, if I disagree with you and I think you're wrong, therefore I am justified in treating you like dirt because you're wrong and you deserve to be treated like dirt. That's kind of the, the pervading thought of our culture and it's growing. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus says we are to love our enemies. We are to pray for those who abuse us. We are to be kind to those who are mean to us. We are to offer a cup of cold water to those who are trying to bring destruction in our life. We have a, a completely different attitude and action towards those who don't like us and disagree with us and are actually trying to do us harm. That's the gospel call. But when the church reads that and says, but well, that's not realistic. Well, in my office, that wouldn't work. And well, I, you don't know my brother-in-law and... and 
It's neglecting the word of God and thinking that we're not bringing self-destruction into our life. So I'll go back to this question again. Does the Bible for you spark joy? Does it make your heart throb? Does it make your heart flutter? Or are you in danger of becoming the generation that has a very high value of this thing, but functionally is neglecting it? If you think you may be there, I just want to challenge you, invite you, encourage you, join a discipleship group in September. We have discipleship groups in our church. They are groups of three to five people who meet weekly for the purpose of becoming disciples who can make disciples The whole purpose is to practice the spiritual disciplines of reading the Bible regularly, uh, meditating on it, memorizing, praying with and for each other. Uh, It's a way of being held accountable. It's a way to be encouraged to grow in these areas. And uh, I just want to challenge you. We had 53 adults in our church in the spring of this year being D groups, looking for more of that here in the fall. The way to join a D group, The step to join a D group is at our Call for Disciple event, which is the second Sunday night in September, September the 8th, 6 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Uh, Come to that and say, I want to be in a D group because I do not want to be among those who have a high value of this book but completely neglect the book. I want to have the heart of Josiah. I want to have a heart that is responsive to the Word of God. I want to have a Psalm 19 heart. And one way to do that is to join a discipleship group. Let's pray together.